Welcome back to Wilds and Water Sailing. We kick this episode off as we sail towards the northwestern tip of Banks Island, marking the official start to our southbound journey, accompanied by our good friends Paul and Carolyn on Hibito. There was no doubt that Paul and Carolyn won the race from Porcher Island to our first stop on Banks, but the day was absolutely gorgeous and we were happy to be sailing along at a great pace even if we were in second place. Just over two miles in from open water, among rocky islets layered in lichens, dashed in bright greenery and skirted with giant kelp beds, the entrance to Griffith Harbour was what you might refer to as a charming obstacle course. Happily tucked into the harbour, our first evening on Banks did not disappoint. Banks Island lies within the unceded territory of the Coast Simshian First Nation. It is 72 kilometres long and 18 kilometres across at its widest point. Banks was the name given to the island in 1787 by Archibald Menzies, botanist and surgeon of the fur trading vessel Princess Royal, in honour of Sir Joseph Banks, at the time President of the Royal Society. Like the other islands nearby, Banks is part of the Hecate Depression Physiographic Unit. Although Banks is comparable in both geology and ecology to the islands further north, like Porcher for instance, after sailing the 40 miles south it felt like we had entered a completely different season. The air, although still fresh, had the true warmth of spring, and wildflowers and shrubs scattered across the muskeg were beginning to bloom. The ubiquitous carpets of bryophytes were now bursting to life, saturated in rich greens and dotted with white, yellow, and pink.
We didn't have much time booked for Griffith, as we were all antsy to keep moving. But there was one more thing Conley and I really wanted to do before we left. The next day we started out tacking through the rocky islets and set out towards our next stop, Kingtown Inlet, about 15 nautical miles south of Griffith. Once we were out in the open, we rolled up the jib and prepared to deploy our larger Genoa head sail for a nice reach to the southeast. As we approached our destination, the seas, which had been relatively calm all day, began rolling in a westerly swell. We realized only as we neared the entrance that our route plan had us dog-legging through a narrow pass guarded by a rocky shore on one side and reefs on the other. The reefs, in combination with the westerly swell, were now producing large breaking seas. I'm not going to lie, it was pretty nerve wracking, but other than being uncomfortable, the reefs were breaking up the waves well. After about 15 minutes of white knuckling it, we thankfully made it through the pass unscathed, only to find Paul and Carolyn, who had made it through much earlier, leisurely touring the inner bay while they waited for our arrival. 
Our anchors just happened to have a good view of the sporty entrance we had just gone through, where the swells were still piling up and crashing into white water over the reefs. Welcome to Kingtown Inlet, another wild and memorable vista to add to this outside passage route. The inlet extends a ways, although we didn't venture in too far during this trip. Instead, we went for a hike through the lowlands where we discovered a small lake absolutely filled with tadpoles. At this stage, these tadpoles breathe through gills and lack the legs they'll later develop as they become adults. If you haven't seen Maxwell Hone's Big Little Migration, it's an absolute must. I'll put the link for that video in the description below. After a day of wandering the lowlands of Kingtown, we set out early the next morning. This time we decided to take the more direct route and head straight through what had looked like a clear break in the reef in our aerial footage. I stood watch on bow while Conley steered us clear of any obstacles. As we got out of the anchorage and put our sails up, the fog was closing in thick around us, so much that we could barely make out Hibito sailing just on ahead. It was a good thing they came back for us or we would have lost them. It's nine, quarter after nine in the morning and we've been sailing for a few hours now and it's time to have a third cup of coffee. Take your time, take your time, take your time. The winds are totally cold, eh? <laughs> we have no choice but to take our time. Yeah, it's about five or six knots, so our tacks are not looking good. Like 160 <laughs> degrees. <laughs> you get the current against you now. Yeah, we're gonna blame it on the current. That's it. <laughs> the, best, the best thing to do. <laughs> Later. See you soon.
Nine years old dogs, not dogs. Yeah. We must uh, explore this part. I didn't do this, but there was with low water, there was uh, nothing. Okay. But see, here's all dogs here behind me. There's a rock and here's a rock behind me. That rock right there? Yeah, the rock. <laughs> must stay here somewhere. Okay. Sounds good. Where's your anchor at? Straight on. I, I must call you. I said, what's happening? Maybe I am the wrong place again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the current was going up, I think. This mine that we're gonna go and look at either today or tomorrow got, uh, I think it's what, six years now? They got shut down by the nations because they had no uh, containment for their tailings. So they were just letting it flow right into the ocean. And uh, they pretty much just had to shut down right away and so there's a bunch of stuff left over which we're gonna go and check out. Oh yeah, it's like brand new. Yeah. Jeez. The initial mining for the Yellow Giant Gold Project on Banks Island commenced at the beginning of 2013 with commercial production beginning in January of 2015. I chatted with the fellow who had worked at the mine during its active operations and he reported that not only were environmental management requirements not being met, there was regularly a disregard for the health and safety of the mine employees, putting workers in harm's way to hasten production. To quote a CBC News article, when the company was given permission to operate, Mines Minister Bill Bennett touted the company as a key contributor to the province's resource economy. Behind the scenes, however, concerns were already being raised. One environmental assessment manager expressed that this mine was operating under a kind of Wild West mentality. Being isolated, they were basically able to do whatever they wanted, as no one was around to say differently. In the 15 months after Banks Island Gold received its permits, the government had yet to come and inspect the mine site. In the summer of 2015, the mine and operations were shut down immediately after an environmental assessment determined that not only had the mine been failing to comply, with the environmental permits, they had also been discharging toxic effluent into nearby creeks, ponds, woodlands, wetlands, and the ocean. Soon after abandoning site, the company filed for bankruptcy. Although the mine has been shut down for years, with toxic runoff still affecting the environment, it didn't appear that any further action as far as site cleanup or reclamation steps have been taken. After a bit of further investigation, it sounds like the government has no plan to deal with this environmental disaster anytime soon. Thanks so much for watching this episode and for joining us for these adventures. If you have any questions, comments, or feedback, we'd love to hear from you in the comments box below. And don't forget to hit that like button. Join us next time for an exciting wolf encounter, more sailing, and another new island to explore. <laughs>